I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Hey Lurkers, welcome to episode 33. For today's episode, we are hopping across the pond to Ireland to discuss Haunted Lep Castle. And yes, it is spelled like the word leap, but it is pronounced Lep. If you are a diehard paranormal fan, you may already be familiar with some of the history and paranormal phenomena associated with the castle. It has been featured on Ghost Hunters and Most Haunted along with a few other different paranormal television shows. It's always been on my list of places that I would love to visit. It has the designation of being the most haunted castle in Ireland. According to YourIrishAdventure.com, there are an estimated 30,000 castles, including castle ruins, in the country of Ireland. That's not an error. 30,000 is the correct number. So that makes it 1 in 30,000. I'm going to apologize ahead of time in case I mispronounce some of the names here. I'm going to do my best so I don't have my Irish grandmother haunting me over it. But hey, I can't be perfect all the time. I'm like Mary Poppins. I'm practically perfect in every way. Not completely perfect. Lep Castle is located in Coolderry, County Offaly in Ireland, which is nearly in the heart of the country. The main tower or keep was constructed sometime between the 13th and the late 15th century. There are varying dates given, though 1250 is the most likely date. There is evidence that the castle was constructed on the same site as another ancient stone structure that was allegedly used by druids for religious initiation ceremonies. Further evidence shows that the site had been consistently occupied since the Iron Age, or around 500 BC, and possibly since the Neolithic times. Druids, for those not familiar, were concerned with the natural world and its powers, and considered trees especially sacred. They were revered for their wisdom, but they were also greatly feared. They connected the people with their gods, but also acted as teachers, judges, and philosophers. There are written Roman records of druidic human sacrifice though there is no definitive evidence to support that. But still maybe not a good idea to build your house or castle on a former Druid religious site. So Lep Castle is built most likely in 1250, and most likely on the site where Druids held religious ceremonies, and who knows what else over the centuries. It was built by the O'Bannon clan, and was originally called Lame e Bannon, which is Leap of the Bannons. Legends say that two O'Bannon brothers were arguing over which would be the chieftain of the castle, so they decided they would each jump off a large rock outcropping located at the future castle site, and the survivor would control the castle and the family's clan. I don't know about you, but that really doesn't sound like a good idea. I would just do rock, paper, scissors. The winner of this competition is lost to time, if the legend is even true at all but supposedly it's the reason why it's called Leap of the Bannons. So the Bannons were a wealthy and powerful family themselves, but they were pledged to the more powerful O'Carroll family, who ended up taking control of the castle. Just to give you a little bit of a warning here, the O'Carroll history reads like a script of Game of Thrones, with maybe a little more backstabbing, literally, and no cool dragons. So the O'Carrolls were a fierce and brutal clan, known to be particularly violent and cunning in their attempts for domination, and they used the castle site for battles and numerous massacres. In 1513, there was an attempt by Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare, to seize the castle. This attempt failed. Three years later, in 1516, he made another more successful attempt that left the castle partially destroyed. The castle ended up being known as the Bloody Castle because of the murders and bloodshed that occurred there. By 1557, the O'Carrolls gained full control of Lep, and it became their primary stronghold. 
I'm going to give you a brief history of some of the people within the O'Carroll clan to give you an idea of just how bloody a history this place has. I skipped some of it. <laughs> We're fast forwarding to uh, one of the sons because there's only so much that you want to hear about or that I want to share because it's just ridiculous. You're going to find out here in a second. So brief history of the O'Carrolls at Lep. Ferganan. O'Carroll was ruler of the castle and rumored to have killed a dinner guest at the dinner table in the castle and his steward, Ferganon's steward, killed the guest servant in the guardroom. Ferganon was murdered by the O'Molois and succeeded by his son, Tyg, the One-Eyed. I don't know why he has one eye. So Tyg, the One-Eyed, had a brother who was a priest and while the priest was in the middle of performing mass with family members in the castle chapel, Tyg ran his brother through with a sword in front of the family, leaving his brother, the priest, to die bleeding on the altar. So Tyg the One-Eye was later killed by his cousin, Care O'Carroll. Then Care was killed by Tyg's younger brother, William the Pale O'Carroll. William the Pale was, you guessed it, killed by his O'Connor relatives. William had four sons, and his son John succeeded his father. But John was killed the next year by his cousin Mulroney, who was the son of the one-eyed Tyg. This murder was quickly avenged by John's brother Charles, who killed Mulroney and became the Prince of Ely. He pledged his loyalty to England, and he was knighted. Sir Charles, at some point, feels he can't trust some of his men and the mercenaries that he's hired, so, when it was time to pay them for their services, Sir Charles and a couple of men that he still trusted killed about 150 men in their sleep. There is a conflict known as Tyrone's Rebellion, or the Nine Years' War, where the attempt was made to drive the English out of Ireland. Sir Charles chose not to join the rebellion. He is then killed by a faction during the rebellion in retaliation for killing the 150 men who were all from one clan. In 1629, the castle was officially granted to Sir Charles's nephew, John O'Carroll. The castle was taken by Cromwell's force in 1649 and granted to John Darby, a Cromwellian soldier and grandson of William the Pale O'Carroll, in payment for services. It was taken and given to John O'Carroll again, then taken and given back to John Darby finally. There's a lot of paraphrasing in all of this, so my apologies to any historians or anybody who is up on Irish history or O'Carroll clan history. I'm just trying to tell you how bloody everything is. Everybody's killing everybody else. Somebody comes to power, somebody else kills them. Somebody else kills that person for killing the person that he killed. Then he gets killed by somebody else who wants to take over. It's ridiculous. Like I said, it's like Game of Thrones, but there's no dragons. With the Darby family gaining control, the bloodshed came to an end. There was one John Darby who owned the property, who allegedly hid his wealth throughout the castle. He was convicted of treason and set to be hung, drawn, and quartered, but he was eventually pardoned. While being jailed, he is said to have gone insane. The Darbys all had sons that they named John or Jonathan, so it gets a little confusing for a bit. Eventually, we get to a John Darby in 1880, who now owns the castle. He marries a woman named Mildred in 1889, and they live in the castle together. This is at the height of the spiritualism movement. Mildred Darby wrote gothic novels and regularly held seances in the castle, and that led to publicity about the castle and its reported ghosts. And I promise we're going to get to the ghosts here shortly, but... I need to share everything with you so you really know what's behind all of these hauntings. You know, the brothers killing brothers and cousins avenging cousins and brothers and everything else probably is why it's haunted. It's kind of a no-brainer. Mildred was actually a highly talented author who wrote under the pen name Andrew Mary, and by 1910 she had published numerous short stories as well as three well-reviewed novels. Her success irritated her husband, who was known as an arrogant man with a violent temper. John and Mildred Darby also began expanding the central keep with significant extensions, and to pay for these renovations, rents were raised and a good bit of land was sold. Wealthy families with large estates often had people renting farmhouses and land, but some of these tenants that they had were getting a little ticked off, and they started to refuse to pay the rent. 
In 1922, civil war broke out in Ireland over British rule. The Darbys fled the castle because they were an English family who owned an Irish castle. They left behind a caretaker, Richard Dawkins, and his wife and infant. At 2.20 a.m. July 30, 1922, 11 raiders knocked on the door. Dawkins opened it and was held at gunpoint and told that the castle was going to be burned to the ground. They gave Dawkins 20 minutes to get his wife and child out of the castle. The raiders poured gas all over the place and set fire to the building. After that, the main building was still intact. Looters took furniture and items that were not destroyed. Then, on the 31st of July, men showed up and burned a portion of the castle that hadn't been burned the day before. There may have been some explosives involved in the destruction as well. Fast forward to 1974, the castle ruins were purchased by an Australian named Peter Bartlett, who was related to the original builders, the O'Bannons, on his mother's side. Along with builder Joe Sullivan, Bartlett began extensive restoration work on the castle that continued until he died in 1989. In 1991, the castle was purchased by musician Sean Ryan, who continues to do restoration work on the castle today. He still lives there with his family. During renovations of the castle in the 1900s, workers found an oubliette behind the wall in the chapel. An oubliette, or a little place of forgetting, is a dungeon found in medieval castles that is more or less a narrow vertical shaft. The only access was through a trap door in the ceiling, and it was nearly impossible to escape from. Lep's oubliette was an eight-foot shaft with a wooden spike at the bottom. If you were lucky enough to miss the spike, you slowly starve to death while listening to the sounds of life going on in the castle around you. I think I would rather land on the spike. At the bottom of the oubliette shaft, they found numerous human skeletons piled on the wooden spike. When it was cleaned out, it took three cartloads, and by cartloads I mean carts pulled by horses. It took three cartloads to remove all the bones. It was then covered over to keep people away from it. It was believed that the O'Carrolls would drop guests through the trap door to be impaled on the spike eight feet below. It's also thought that this is where some, if not all, of the 150 men killed by Sir Charles ended up. While cleaning out the oubliette, a pocket watch dating from 1840 was found inside, so it is possible that the oubliette was used as recently as then, which would have been during the Darby's ownership. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to discuss the hauntings. Because how could this place not be haunted? We have druids, brothers killing brothers on the property, people killing other people, and arson. I read somewhere that there are around 19 different spirits that have been encountered at the castle. One of those is said to be the crazy John Darby, whose ghost roams the castle looking for his hidden treasures. He's the one who was found guilty of treason and set to be hung, drawn, and quartered, and was then pardoned, but while he was in jail, he went insane. But prior to that, when he lived in the castle, he hid his wealth in different areas, so his ghost is seen searching the castle looking for his hidden treasure. Mildred Darby began experiencing some weird things while she lived in the house from 1889 to 1922, which isn't a stretch since she was into seances and automatic writing. She wrote the following snippet regarding some of the hauntings in the house. Noises like furniture being moved were frequently heard at night, and strangers staying with us have often asked why the servants turned out the rooms underneath them at such an unusual hour. The front doorbell sometimes rang, and I have gone down but found no one. There's also a slight mention that Peter Bartlett, who owned the castle from 1974 until his death in 1989, knew of and believed in many spirits that haunted the castle, so much so that he flew in a white witch from Mexico. This witch spent a lot of time in the castle and in the chap chapel in particular. When she came out, she informed Bartlett that the spirits would no longer be malevolent, but that they were not ready to leave. There's no doubt that there are a lot of ghosts haunting the halls of what is considered Ireland's most haunted home. First up, the chapel, where Ty O'Carroll killed his brother, who was a priest, by running him through with a sword while he was in the middle of Mass, with his family in presence. It's this history that gives it the name, the Bloody Chapel. It's home to many spirits of Lep Castle. People passing by at night have reported seeing bright light streaming out of the upper windows, and this has been reported since the time of the Darby family. 
This was even seen when the castle was nothing more but a burned out shell. And today, people have called the current owners informing them the chapel is completely illuminated. A strange smell of rubber has also been reported by people visiting in the upper hall. Of course, the ghost of, of the O'Carroll priest is also seen in the chapel. I mean, the guy was run through with a sword in the middle of a Catholic mass and a castle built on the site of a Druid religious site. I think the only things that don't show up here are Gozer the Destructor and the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. So the ghost of o the O'Carroll priest has been seen on many occasions in the chapel. His spirit has also been seen lurking on the stairway below and leaving the chapel through the western door and going down the northern stairs. Sean Ryan, who's the current castle owner, believes the priest acts as more of a guardian spirit of the castle. There's also a man that seems to live in the oubliette. He's sometimes seen leaving the chapel and wandering down to the lower levels of the castle. There's a room that is referred to as the muckle or murder hole room, though no one is certain where exactly the room is located. There's some speculation that it was in the area of the northern rooms, which were situated below the location of the oubliette. There is some thought that it's referring to the chapel itself. Former owner Mildred Darby shared her experience with the murder hole room in an article. I put my hand out of bed, snapping my fingers to call Nell a terrier. My hand was suddenly in the grasp of another hand, a soft, cool hand at a temperature perceptively below my own flesh. To say I was astonished would but mildly convey my feelings. After a few seconds of steady pressure, the other hand let go, and almost simultaneously I heard a heavy sliding fall, like the collapse of a large body at the foot of the bed. When in absolute stillness of the room, there sounded a deep human groan, and some half-articulated words, or to be more accurate, prayers. She went on to talk about people staying in the room. People have complained before, in fact. We don't generally put anyone out there now. The room is called the Muckle or Murder Hole Room, and the story goes that the stain on the floor is the blood of a man stabbed there by his brother. Two O'Carrolls quarreled over the ownership of the castle. The room had been disused for 50 years or more when we did it up. The stain has been planed off the board several times, but it always comes again creeps up from below in a few hours. People speculate it's possibly the chapel because Tig, the one-eyed, killed his brother who was the priest in the chapel, but they're not the only brothers who killed each other, so it's hard to say if that's exactly the room, but it's believed it's in that chapel area or somewhere below the chapel rooms, which would be below the oubliette. On the property is a building that is known as the priest's house, since the castle was burned in 1922, the priest's house is still just an empty shell, but shadowy forms have been seen wandering through the empty building. When Mildred Darby lived in the house, she described the following experiences in the priest's house. There is something heavy that lies on people's beds and snores, and they feel the weight of a great body pressing against them in a room in the priest's house. A burly man in rough clothes like a peasant, he always pushes a heavy barrel up the back steps of the wing near the servants' bedrooms, when just at the top, the barrel rolls down and all disappears. A monk with a tonsure and cow walks in at one window and out another. So there are two ghosts that are seen, the peasant man with the barrel that he rolls up to the top and then they disappear, and then also a monk is seen there as well. The Red Lady is another apparition that was encountered during the time the Darbys lived in the castle. This ghost has been described as a tall woman, clothed in a red dress or a red cloak, carrying a dagger in her hand in a menacing way. A strange glow is seen radiating within her. People who have encountered this ghost have remarked on the intense cold filling the room and creeping into their heart. It's thought that the woman was captured by an O'Carroll and raped. Some stories claim that she was kept there in the castle as a sex slave of sorts by several of the O'Carrolls. Either way, there was a baby born as a result of this, and the baby was stabbed to death by the O'Carroll. Distraught, the woman then killed herself with the same blade that was used on her child. Other stories say the O'Carrolls killed her and the baby both. Not that it really matters, I guess. Either way, they were both stabbed to death. A guest of the Darbys wrote their account of meeting the Red Lady. 
On the 31st of October, I went to my bedroom about 11 p.m. During the night, the time was 12.45 a.m., as I subsequently saw my watch, I felt that I was awakened by somebody in my room. It was pitch dark, and at first I could see nothing. I was wide awake with an extraordinary cold feeling at my heart that rapidly increased in intensity. Almost immediately, I felt as much as saw that there was a tall figure in the middle of the room. My first impression was that Darby himself was there, as no other member of the household would correspond to the height. What is it? I asked. There was no answer, but now I could see dimly at first, and with increasing distinctness, that the tall figure was clothed from head to foot in red, with its right hand raised menacingly in the air. To my utter astonishment, I could see the light which illuminated the figure was from within, having very much the effect of the dark lantern used in a photographer's room. As the figure advanced towards me, the light increased, and I could see distinctly that the form was that of a very tall woman holding some sort of a weapon, knife or dagger, in her hand. What is it? I asked again. Who is it? And then hurriedly struck a match and lit my candle. As the flame of the match and candle illuminated the room, I looked around, and the room was empty. Mildred Darby said that the woman wore a historic scarlet silk dress that rustles. She haunts the area of the blue room that was always used as the nursery. She is sometimes seen sobbing at the foot of the children's beds. Sadly, the ghosts of two young children are also seen at Lep Castle. They are mainly seen playing in the main hall and running up the stairwell. They are believed to have lived in the castle sometime in the 1600s. Emily is the older of the two ghosts. She seems to be around the age of 11 or 12, and she apparently died from falling from the castle's southeastern battlements. People outside the castle have reported seeing a girl falling off the castle roof and disappearing before she hits the ground. Charlotte is the other ghost child, and she is thought to be around six or seven years of age. She has been seen with a deformed leg that drags backwards behind her. Mildred Darby also had interaction with a young ghost. She wrote, Another night I was sleeping with my little girl. I awoke and saw a girl with long, fair hair standing at the fireplace, one hand at her side, the other on the chimney piece. Thinking at first it was my little girl, I felt on the pillow to see if she was gone, but she was still fast asleep. There was no fire or light of any kind in the room. Sean Ryan, the current owner and resident of the castle, has had run-ins with Emily and Charlotte himself. He's seen both of the ghosts and has heard screams coming from the battlements. He believes that these are the screams of Emily falling to her death. There's a governess or nanny frequently seen in the main hall, and she's often seen with the ghosts of Emily and Charlotte. This apparition seems to show herself more to visitors to the castle rather than the owner and current resident. Guests have reported being touched on the shoulder or having someone brush against them. A friend of Sean Ryan was having lunch at Lep Castle one day, and both the guest and another female guest sitting near the fire saw a proud lady in Victorian attire walk diagonally across the main hall. After discussing what they had seen, the guest, who was previously a skeptic, decided to change his thoughts on ghosts. There's another apparition seen and heard at the castle, referred to as the murdered woman. She's been seen and heard since the time of the Darbys. She's thought to have been murdered by, and this is going to be a shocker for you, one of the O'Carroll clan. She's seen wearing very little clothing and a red cloth over her face. She screams loudly twice and then disappears. Mildred Darby recorded her own account of witnessing the murdered woman. She wrote, One night I was sitting talking with my governess. I got up, said goodnight, and opened the door, which was on top of the back staircase. As I did so, I heard someone, a woman, come slowly upstairs, past us, to a window at the end of the landing, and then with a shriek, fall heavily. As she passed, it was bitterly cold, and I drew back into the room, but did not say anything as it might frighten the governess. Current owner Sean Ryan has heard a woman screaming, and sometimes feels the hand of a woman touching his shoulder. There's also a reenactment of sorts of two O'Carroll brothers fighting over a lover. She's chased along the gallery and then stabbed. They all disappear, and then the entire keep is lit up. 
There's a little old man with a green cutaway coat, knee breeches, and bright shoe buckles holding a leather bag. He's sometimes seen with a little old woman with skinny hands, long black mitts, old-fashioned dress, and a big headdress. Both are sometimes seen with an old man dressed like a priest with an intensely cunning face. The green-clad old man tries to stop people. The most terrifying paranormal thing at Lep Castle is what is known as an elemental. Elementals are primitive and chaotic, but also capable of reasoning and clever actions. They can appear in almost infinite variety of shapes and sizes. They can be highly aggressive and incredibly destructive. They come in four classes that correspond with the four elements, which is where the name comes from commonly invoked by those who study and follow nature-based religions. Like druids. But we're going to get to that in a minute. The origin and first appearance of the elemental of Lep Castle is unknown, though there are vague mentions of a problem spirit at Lep since very early times. But with as many spirits as there are here, who knows which one that refers to. Mildred Darby wrote about her encounter with a thing that is sometimes referred to simply as It. Not to be confused with the giant clown that lives in the sewer system. Though if I remember correctly, he could change into what your biggest fear was. I don't know. That movie creeps me out. So I'm going to share Mildred Darby's account, as well as a few other first-hand, first-hand accounts of experiences with the elemental at Lep. Uh, Mildred Darby wrote, Suddenly, two hands were laid on my shoulders. I turned round sharply and saw, as clearly as I see you now, a gray thing, standing a couple of feet from me, with its bent arms raised as if it were cursing me. I cannot describe in words how utterly awful the thing was, its very undefinableness rendering the horrible shadow more gruesome. Human in shape, a little shorter than I am, I could just make out the shape of big black holes like great eyes and sharp features, but the whole figurehead face, hands, and all was gray, unclean, bluish gray, something of the color and appearance of common cotton wool. But oh, so sinister, repulsive, and devilish. My friends who are clever about occult things say it's what is called an elemental. The thing was about the size of a sheep, thin, gaunt, and shadowy in parts. Its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman, as its vileness, with large holes of blackness for eyes, loose slobbery lips, and a thick saliva-dripping jaw, sloping back suddenly into its neck. Nose it had none, only spreading cancerous cavities, the whole face being a uniform tint of gray. This, too, was the color of the dark, coarse hair covering its head, neck, and body. Its forearms were thickly coated with the same hair. So were its paws, large, loose, and hand-shaped, and it sat on its hind legs. One hand or paw was raised, and a claw-like finger was extended, ready to scratch the paint. Its lusterless eyes, which seemed half decomposed and looked incredibly foul, stared into mine, and the horrible smell which had before offended my nostrils only a hundred times intensified came up to my face, filling me with a deadly nausea. I noticed the lower half of the creature was indefinite and seemed semi-transparent at least. I could see the framework of the door that led into the gallery through its body. Then there was a letter in response to the article that Mildred Darby wrote that I just read, referring to her encounter of the elemental. And this relates to somebody else's encounter while they were staying at the castle. I saw your eyes fixed upon something above our heads, and the next minute my own eyes were filled by the sight of a thing in the gallery looking down at us. There was plenty of light from the lamps in the hall, and the one above on the wall at the corner of the gallery, for every one of us to see quite plainly the gray-colored figure about the height of a small grown-up person looking down at us. I wish I thought I could ever forget the sight of that gray figure with the dark spots like holes in its head instead of eyes, standing with gray arms folded on the gallery railing, looking down at us. Then, just as he put foot on the gallery, the thing that he saw there that we were watching suddenly faded out of sight. 
The thing did not move, only became less and less visible until it vanished. So then there was a letter that Mildred Darby sent to a Sydney Carroll, and it reads, The last appearance of the Elemental were on November 25th, 1915, and I deduct again last November from the gate of my husband, really wild with rage, fright, coming into my room at midnight to let fly at me for again dressing up things to try and frighten me. On the 25th November 1915, two of our servants, knowing the master would be late and that I was driving that afternoon, had invited friends, two soldiers from the barracks at Burr, distant the other side six miles. They came rather late and my husband came home early, so the visitors had to be kept out of sight in the lower regions of one of the wings, in the priest's house and were unable to be shown the center tower, the very lofty hall. At 7.15, my husband and I went up to dress for dinner. My room in extremity of house from kitchens, his dressing room next door to me. Whilst dressing, I was startled by a loud yell of terror, stricken male and female voices coming apparently from the hall, and ran out to see the cause. My husband was out ahead of me at his heels. I passed through the corridor of wing and onto the gallery wing, rounds two sides of the hall. Two lamps on gallery, two more in hall below. On the gallery, leaning with hands, resting on its rail, I saw the thing, the elemental, and smelt it only too well. At the same moment, my husband pulled up sharply about ten feet from the thing, and half turning let fly a volley of abuse at me ending up quote dressing up a thing like that to try and make a fool of me and now you'll say i've seen something and i have not seen anything and there is nothing to see or ever was the la this last speech without a pause began waving one hand at the thing end up by stalking back to his dressing room still abusing me for trying to give him a fright as he was speaking, the elemental grew fainter and fainter in its outlines until it disappeared. By the sounds from my husband's room, I judged he was employed as I was myself in preparing an empty spot for our coming dinner. He never made any inquiry as to the yell that called us both out, and from that day to this has not mentioned the incident to me. I heard from our servants that when we went to dress for dinner, they had brought their friends just to show them the hall and when all four had suddenly seen and smelt the elemental looking down at them from the gallery. We all got such a turn. We couldn't help letting out a ball, then fled to servants' quarters, where all four were very sick. The two maids had letters necessitating their going home next day, and they did not return. So, basically, what happened here was they, the servants had guests over. John Darby, as I had mentioned before, was kind of a jerk and had a violent temper and was really irritated at his wife's success and didn't really care for her little ghost stories. They hear somebody yell, they both come out, she sees the elemental and smells it because apparently it smells like a decomposing corpse, which really is rank. And he must see it, but he says that she is dressing up something in an attempt to scare him and make him claim that he's seeing ghosts too because he didn't see any ghosts, he didn't believe in any of that. So he thinks she's tricking him, when in fact he's actually seeing the same thing everybody else is screaming about. This next account of an encounter with the Elemental took place during an investigation in 2002. And it reads, June 18, 2002. I traveled to Lepp Castle in order to make a show for a local TV network and this was my first time in the notorious castle I had heard so much about. So the show went well, but I wanted to try the UV on the camcorder while still shooting. I had sent something down the old access to the battlements earlier and never went down. I climbed the stairs with the camcorder in front. The light from the UV allowed me to see about six feet ahead and no more, so I climbed slowly. I opened the gothic-style door and made my way very slowly down the narrow passage. About ten feet in, I thought I saw something move, and I lifted my head. I could feel something was wrong, but I had no idea what. This time, with the camera dropped, I thought I saw a glow come from around the corner, and then it went back in. 
I stood and studied this for a while and thought it may be a side effect of the UV, which can be common. A few steps more and my body was weakening fast. It was a strange sensation. Suddenly, this mass of white-like mist raced around the corner like a bull. Even the rubbish on the floor scattered as it approached its speed. The passage was tight and I turned to my left to try and get out, but it was too late. I felt the pain as if something had just pierced under my right rib cage and went all the way back through to the back. This startled me a little and we proceeded to arrange shooting in the cellars. The audio refused to tape again in the cellars and I felt really odd. I was sweating heavily and was becoming very weak and drowned in dread. Right after the incident in the tunnel, it felt as if a hole in my chest had been punctured on a spiritual level and my life was seeping into the stones. In order to describe it and let the reader understand, they would have had to experience a large blood loss sometime in their lives. As they felt the blood drain, this weakness would become prominent. Other words, they were experiencing the onset of death. I was dying. So this one claims that this was an encounter with the elemental, but I am going to argue that this is possibly an encounter with the red lady, that she wasn't completely manifested. She is associated with um, a penetrating coldness that seems to hit you inside, like in your heart. And what this person is describing seems almost kind of like a knife attack piercing your heart all the way through. It fits with the descriptions of the Red Lady and how she shows up with a penetrating cold that pierces you within and intensifies and that she seems to be menacing. It's almost like she came at, at this person. I don't know. It's complete speculation on my part, but they don't mention the actual vision of the elemental. They don't mention the smell of the elemental. So I don't think this is not that it makes it any less of an experience, but I don't think it's the elemental. I think it's one of the other uh, spirits. There's another personal encounter with the elemental that took place in June of 2006. It says, I looked into the darkness of a corridor that exited the spiral stairway. I became aware of the smell of sulfur. It was as if boxes and boxes of matches had suddenly been lit at once. I looked at my friend who had taken me to visit Lep Castle. He could also smell the sulfur. I stared into the darkness of the corridor and had the impression that a beast like a bear or lion was staring back at me. The tension was rising like a ticking time bomb. My friend then closed the door and said, to let sleeping dogs lie, meaning sometimes you just have to leave things alone. He was a friend of Sean Ryan, and I certainly did not want to dis disrespect either of them by stirring up the elemental. Supposedly, the elemental has the potential to cause great harm to anyone that is on the receiving end of an attack. There was one other encounter and first-person encounter of the elemental, and I'm going to go ahead and share it. It was a couple of uh, Dublin ghost hunters, and they said... Burnt out during the 1920s, Lepp's looks lived up to its reputation. Narrow gothic windows, ivy-covered towers, bats, and a barn owl. It was like a set from a Vincent Price movie. We crept in through a gaping doorway. Our flashlights revealed a huge hole in the stone-floored front hall, and we gingerly made our way around the edge, heading for the spiral staircase. No ghost would make us nervous. We were the Dublin Ghostbusters. Despite our confidence, we found ourselves talking in whispers. A slight sound behind me and I spun like a ballerina to see the cause. But as I spun around, I slipped and then dropped through the hole in the floor. The flashlight hit a rock and went out. Just above me, just out of reach, I could see the jagged outline of the floor. I could hear friends coming to help me. And then, in the darkness, I could hear a sniffling, snorkly sort of noise. There was a smell too, a horrid, rotten smell. I am not athletic, but that night, terror put rockets into my heels. I shot upwards. Scrambling madly, I made the doorway and did not stop running till I was safely in the car. So who or what is the elemental? There are a few theories. The first, and in my opinion, the one that makes the most sense, is that it was something that was conjured by the druids to protect their sacred ground. 
Another theory is that Gerald Fitzgerald, the Earl of Kildare, was a dabbler in the occult and that he conjured the elemental back in 1513 or 16 uh, to burn the castle from within and remove anyone that stood in his way in his pursuit to take over the castle. You'll remember Gerald Fitzgerald was the guy who made the couple attempts to take over to storm the castle, if you will. Have fun storming the castle! Local legends say that the elemental is actually the spirit of one of the O'Carroll clan who died of leprosy, and that explains the smell of decaying flesh and the disfigurement of the face. Perhaps the discovery and cleaning out of the oubliette has something to do with awakening the nasty thing. Or, finally, also a good possibility is that Mildred Darby brought the elemental into existence with her seances and automatic writing sessions she held at the castle. Possibly she just woke the thing back up. We probably won't ever really know exactly what the elemental is or was. My best guess would be that, based on the little bit of knowledge I have regarding elementals, and I didn't know about them very long... <laughs> I say that, but it was like in the 90s, and that was, what, 30 years ago? So back in the 90s, I actually uh, met up with somebody with, I think he ended up being on Ghost Hunters International, an Irishman, Barry? I don't know. I, I think his name was Barry. It was a while ago. And we were discussing uh, things in Gettysburg, and he mentioned elementals, and I had never heard of them before. But my understanding and how he explained it is that Elementals are typically conjured by those who have nature religions. So in the United States, it would be Native Americans may be able to conjure up something like an elemental. In this case, I think the Druids, who actually had religious ceremonies there at the site, they had a building there prior to Lep Castle being built on the property. And I think it's possible that something that they did, some of their ceremonies may have conjured the elemental and it may have been quiet until it was kind of conjured again. I think Mildred Darby's fascination with the occult and her seances that she held, her automatic writing sessions, she was seeking this stuff out and I think that perhaps that that seeking these sort of things woke it back up, whatever it is. Whether it's the actual ghost of somebody who died from leprosy, which it's a possibility, but I don't really lean that way. If, if it's a true elemental, that's not going to be what it is. I don't... <laughs> reading the history of this family, I really don't think that they were going to let somebody with leprosy continue to live and die from leprosy in the castle. I kind of believe that if they, were, if they had leprosy, they're probably going to get run through with a sword pretty darn quick. I, I, I don't see the O'Carrolls letting somebody live and decay away there with a contagious disease. I just, lepers were shunned. I don't think that's a possibility. So basically, we're never really going to know what it was. The current owner, Sean Ryan, he actually allows ghost investigations at the ca castle, which is also his family home. He has experienced several of the spirits in the castle, though he says he has never come across the elemental in the years that he's lived there and he has owned the property since 1991. When he and his wife first moved into the home, he did have a couple of strange accidents. One happened while he was climbing a ladder. The ladder came away from the house somehow, and it resulted in Sean falling and shattering his kneecap. Once he was back on his feet and able to begin restoration work, there was a second accident that ended up resulting in a broken ankle. Sean and his wife ended up hosting their daughter's christening in the chapel, and since that time, things seem to have settled down, or at least the more malevolent experience seems seem to have quieted down. He believes that holding the christening there kind of appeased all of the negative, it kind of, kind of wiped out all of the negative energy that was surrounding the place and brought a more positive spin on things again. He believes that they're kind of like housemates or castlemates, so to speak. That the spirits were there before he was. He lives in harmony with them. He's cool with them as long as they're not going to be a negative or malevolent spirit. So that's going to do it for this episode of Lurk. I hope you enjoyed the stories of Lep Castle. 
Remember, you can find episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast or at lurkpodcast.com. On the website, you can also find links to our socials, and we'd love for you to follow us on one of those. We also have merch available at lurkpodcastmerch.com. Consider giving the gift of Lurk this year with a t-shirt or hoodie. And until next time, keep lurking.